Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's give God some praise. Amen. Amen. Yes. You know, just uh, my son just said amen on the mic, my two-year-old, and I have a testimony to share about him and how God just protects us even when we don't even realize. Uh, yesterday, my wife stepped out, and I bought my kids some bikes and stuff, so they're riding in the, in the driveway, or in the, yeah, the parking driveway, and usually if we come home and we see them in the driveway, we, we normally park on the side of the road, um, so my two-year-old, he was up with me in my office, and he, he, he realized his mom came home. So he went downstairs, and she was taking stuff out of the car on the side of the road. And mind you, like our, the speed limit in our, on our street is like 50 kilometers, so you go pretty fast. And so Levi, he doesn't know anything. He has no sense of danger. He just came and ran into the street as she was trying to get stuff out and she saw it last minute and normally our kid doesn't run out but he saw his mom there he saw his brothers out so he figured it was okay and, the, and there was a car coming and the thing is the the car was still very close to the road where it could have just ran over the child but for some reason the car just stopped right there you know and 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 he was safe and that's why he's he's in here today Amen. So, you know, as my wife was telling me this stuff, you know, sometimes even when, even when God protects us and, um, you know, and, and it's a good thing, sometimes we get that, that anxiety like, man, someone could have died. Someone could have, you know, gotten really seriously injured. And there was just a peace over me because God reminded me that, listen, even when you can't protect your children, I'll protect them. I'll open the eyes of people that are you know, maybe normally wouldn't even pay attention to something like that. She just stopped right where she needed to stop. And so my child's here alive and well. And I, I give God the praise for that. Uh, that's not me. That has nothing to do with me. That's just God in his goodness. Amen. So as I was, you know, preparing, you know, when I, when I came back and just meditating and, and stuff like that, um, you know, God began to deal with me about how... Christians, you know, and he was even challenging me in my own life how we've gotten away from his laws. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I know we're not under the law of Moses. I'm not talking about going under the law of Moses, but I'm talking about being lawless, not having any, any uh, appreciation for the things of God, not having any appreciation for God's order. Amen. Because how many of you know we, we serve a God of order? And in order for there to be order, there must be some rules and some guidelines. And so God was, was dealing with me because, you know, there, there's that parable where Jesus says, you know, many are going to come to me on that day and they're going to say, I cast out demons, I heal the sick, I even prophesy in your name. And he's going to say, I never depart from me, I never knew you. You know, and I used to study that and try to understand, like, how can you be operating in the power of God? How can you be operating in the move of God and still be a castaway? And so God was just dealing with my heart, me personally, about getting back in order with God, with Jesus, what Jesus commanded. Amen? So there's, there's this, this saying and this moniker in Christianity that we're not under any laws. Like, as soon as you try to tell people what the Bible says, it, it seems like they always go to that. Well, I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. You know, but even the, the apostle Peter said that men, unlearned men, take the writings of Paul and they twist them like they do the rest of the scriptures to their own demise. Amen? And so God was just showing me how there is a law that we do have to keep but the thing is now that God is writing it in our heart so that we would have a desire to keep his laws amen so in Jeremiah 31 and 33 I'm just going to pray real quick father I just pray that you would uh, give my lips unction oh God to speak your word um, I pray that you would even prepare our hearts oh God to receive your word um, to receive it with gladness oh God because we know that uh you know, when we know the truth, oh God, it sets us free 
Father, you're not looking to keep us in bondage, oh God, but Lord, you're looking to set us free. So God, I just pray that the word, oh God, the two-edged sword, oh God, that it will cut the preacher and that it will cut the listener as well, oh Father, and that we will leave here not just being hearers of the, of the word, but God, doers of your word by your spirit in Jesus' name, amen. So Jeremiah 31 and 33, and it says, but this will be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And how many of you know where the Israel born from above? So this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and I would write it in their heart and, and I will be their God and they will be my people. So many people today in Christianity, like I was saying before, think that we are not to keep a law. That there is no law. We're just going to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there is no law for us to keep. And that we shouldn't be under a law. No rules. No religion. How many of you guys ever heard that? Right? It's not about rules. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. You know, and the funny thing is Jesus said, if you will abide in me. In other words, if you will have a relationship with me, keep my commandments. You know, but they never mention that part, right? And so many Christians today take Romans 6 and 14 out of context to say that we are not under a law or rules. But this passage is not, in its right context, is not dealing with, about, with God's commandments, but it's talking about being under the law or the power of sin. And if you could turn with me to Romans 6, and I'm going to start reading at verse 12. And if you're there, say amen. Amen. So I'm just going to start reading here. So Romans 6 and 12, it says, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies, that ye should obey the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For ye are not, for, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. All right. And so we're also going to turn here to Romans 7. And I'm going to do a lot of reading in the Bible because sometimes I just like God to speak and, and, and I, I, I'll, I'll minimize myself in my commentary you know, I'll let God speak. But if we can just go real quick to Romans 7. Just give me a second to get there. Oh. All right, so Romans 7, it says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she shall be called an adulteress. For if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of, through the body of Christ, the actual body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that, he, that, we, should, that we should bear fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from, from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the lever, letter. Shall we then... What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. So is the law bad? It's not a, the law in itself is not bad. But on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. All right. So God, so Paul here is talking 
about a woman being married to somebody. And so we know in the old covenant, a man who was married to a wife, the wife was not to depart from the man. And if she did and married another uh, man while she was alive, she will be called an adulteress. So, but here, Paul is making the contrast, meaning through Christ, if our, our sinful nature now is dead through the body of Christ, now we could be married to the nature of Christ. Do you understand? Because if we, if we were to just keep the law by just observing it and just doing what it says on the outward appearance, inwardly, we, we will be transgressing against God. Amen? So that's why some people could say, well, I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to steal. But in their heart, they're lusting. In their heart, they have envy. And so that becomes adultery now because, yes, on the outward appearance, you're doing the right thing. But on the inward man, it's, it's totally carnal. It's totally gone astray. It's totally denying God. And so this is the law that Paul was dealing with. Amen? Paul was not just saying that the law was wrong. He was saying that if it's not in your heart, if you do not delight in the ways of the Lord, then yes, you could come to church and put on a front. Everyone can. Amen? I've said it before. You know, if you have a job, you know how to act right. Or, or, or at least you, you should know, or else you won't stay employed. Amen? If you don't know how to act right on your job, you don't know how to talk and be courteous, normally, normally they let people like that go, or they fire people. Amen? So we all know how to act right. Amen. We all have some, some level of self-control where we, we don't have to swear and cuss and do the wrong things. But what about the heart? What about the places that no one sees but God? What about the places that no one knows about but yourself? Is that one, is that heart surrendered to God? So in Proverbs 6 and 23, it says, For the commandment is a light, and the law, I'm sorry, the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and the reproofs of instruction are a way of life. And I love this scripture because it plainly explains what I'm trying to convey here, or what the scriptures are trying to convey. You see, the commandment is a lamp. It shows you how to live, right? And the law is a light, right? When Jesus came on the scene, he didn't just tell you to stop committing adultery, he told you, don't even think of a woman lustfully in your heart. Amen? That's dealing with the heart. You won't have to worry about committing adultery if you can get it under control or if you could allow the Holy Spirit to change your heart. Amen? Some of you will, I hope some, most of you will never go out there and actually kill somebody. But you can have hatred in your heart. And that hatred now could cause you to go and gossip, uh, spread rumors and falsehoods about people you don't like. Why? Because there is anger in your heart. That's why if you're angry, it's the same thing as if you were to murder somebody. And it's the spirit behind murder. Amen? Now let's go to Genesis 4 because Jesus was definitely not lying when he said if you hate or if you're angry with somebody without cause, it's the same thing as murder. He wasn't lying because we're going to see the spirit of it here in Genesis 4. And now Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And this is for all those people out there thinking that in the garden, like, you know, the serpent had sex with Eve and that's how Cain came. No, it, it tells you right here, Adam and Eve got together and Cain came. Now, yes, something was wrong with Cain and his spirit, but there was no serpent slivering around. And No, there's none of that. Okay, just wanted to put that out there. Just get that on tape as well. All right, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother, Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to, to the Lord. Abel brought uh, of the firstborn of, of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel in, in his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. And Cain was very angry. We know what he did after, but he was very angry. Notice how 
at first, this had nothing to do with Abel because they were both bringing offerings. They both wanted to do the right thing. But although the Bible doesn't really specify what was actually wrong with Cain's offering, I think it has something to do with Abel bringing the first, the firstlings of his flock. He was bringing the best of his flock. And we also know that God cursed the ground. So anything that would come from the ground could be potentially cursed and that's what Cain was offering. So we don't know if Cain was just offering whatever. He didn't care what he offered. He just got some fruits in a basket and just went to, to offer into God and had no consideration. We don't know what it is, but what we do know is that when God had no respect for Cain's offering, Cain became very angry. And so look at this. And his countenance fell. Verse 6. And so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? So basically, if you do what I'm asking you to do, whatever that was, maybe God did have a conversation with Cain about how to bring an offering off the ground. He just didn't have any regard for it. We don't know, but God said, if you do what is well, if you allow my commandments to get into your heart and actually produce something within you that is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But you should master it or rule over it. So sin has intelligence. Amen. It's not just a bad act. There is an actual spirit. There is something called sin that thinks it's looking, it's studying you. It's looking for you to really go against the, the, the commandments of God, to go against the way of God to, that, to the point where you can now open yourself up so that sin could get into your heart. Many times I think about Judas. Amen. We know that the disciples or the gospels um, record that he was a thief. All right. So Judas thought he was slick, he thought he was conniving, he thought he was getting away with something, but it seemed like every time the whatever offering the, the disciples were getting, he was taking it for his own use. He was using it dishonestly. So even as he was following Jesus, even as he was walking with the Lord, and remember, he was one of the, the 70 that was sent out two by two, and he was casting out demons and you know doing many works in his name, but because he had something in his heart, that he didn't deal with, we know what happened in the end. And in verse 8, and now verse 8 in uh, Genesis 4, it says, Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now look at this. I want you to think, I want you to see how wild this is for Cain to be talking to God the way he is. But I, I, I'm here to show you. This is what sin does to your heart. It could darken your heart so, so much to the point where you'll talk reckless to God and talk reckless about the things of God. Verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Talking smart, like a smart Alec, giving a smart response to God. Amen? The Bible says that sin darkens your heart. It will make you so delusional to where you'll start talking back reckless to God. You'll start doing things that you probably wouldn't even do if you were in your right mind. That's what sin does. Sin robs you of your right mind. You want to know what's going on in the world? Why people are marching and, and, and trying to get all this transgender stuff going on? It's because people have rejected the commandment of God for so long. Even in the church, people have rejected the commandment of God for so long that sin has now mastered them. It's mastered them to the point there that they'll, they won't even look at a woman and say she's a woman. And they're actually convinced of this. This is not them trolling us and just saying things to say things. No, sin has taken over in their heart so much that now they're saying things that are outlandish. And to us, it seems crazy, but to them, it makes total sense. Amen? So many times, I, even I, especially when I was younger, I used to think, you know, why, why is the devil like just out here messing with people when he could just 
Turn to God and get it right. But you have to understand, Satan is ancient. He has rejected God from the heavenlies. He saw God in all of his glory and splendor, but iniquity was found in him. Amen? Some people think that the devil was out in heaven making secular music. He wasn't. He wasn't making Beyonce music and Jay-Z and rapping for profanity in heaven. But even though he was singing the praises of God, the Bible says iniquity was in his heart. In his heart. Not in his ways. He was doing the right thing. He was singing. He was singing good. Probably the best musician there is. All right? But what was in his heart caused him to fall out of heaven and to be eternally cursed. Let's go to Revelation 3 and 14 because what the Holy Spirit revealed to me is that Jesus, you know, the controversy with your sin, Jesus could easily wash you of sin. That's not the biggest issue to God, but it's once he washes you of sin, now are you willing to commit your ways to him? You see, there's a difference between being forgiven for your sins and then having your ways committed to him. Because now when your ways are committed to him and you delight yourself in the Lord, now the word, the Bible tells us that he gives us the desires of our heart. And even, I'm going to show you something, even within Christianity, that scripture in itself has been taken out of context. Because people think that if you delight yourself in the Lord, you come to church enough times, you pray long enough, he'll give you whatever you're desiring. And that's not what the scriptures are teaching. The Bible is teaching you that there is a reward for those who delight themselves in the Lord. Because when they do that, now the character of God is infused into their heart. Now their heart is turning like God's heart. They're desiring what God wants naturally. You don't have to convince them. You don't have to argue. You don't, don't even have to teach them about it. There is something within them now that they want what God wants. Amen? David had the testimony that he was a man. Amen? He was a man after God's heart. Not a perfect man. He sinned. We know all of his sins, Bathsheba and all that, etc. But David, the reason why God loved David so much is that his heart, his heart was always in the right place. Even when he was confronted with his sin, he didn't run. He didn't try to hide it. He didn't try to blame it on others. He took accountability. He repented. And, and then even when God struck down that baby that they had, he didn't blame, that, he didn't blame God for that. He said, I will go to him. He won't come to me. Amen. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. That was his heart because he recognized his sin. So Revelation uh, 3 and 14, because how do you get this heart in you? Amen. Some people have that, that dilemma or that thought like, okay, so how do I get the heart of God in me? Now, this is dealing with the, the lukewarm church here. Uh, Revelation 3 and 14, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you are neither hot or cold. I wish you were either hot or cold. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and you do not realize that you are wretch, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's like the worst combination ever. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy of me gold refined in fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed that your shame and nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So the question remains, how do we buy something from God? Amen? And I, this is the part where I was studying, okay, God, how do you buy? Like, how do you actually buy something from you? You know, because even in Christianity, we say stuff like it's a free gift and all that. And it is. But yet, Jesus is counseling us to buy. So think of what money is. Money is time. Amen? You wake up in the morning, you get to work, 
you clock in at 9, some of you 9.15, 9.20 because you come late, but you clock in at 9, and then you're done at 5. You worked 8 hours, and at the end of the week or every 2 weeks, you get a check, something that reflects the time you have put in. Well, the Bible here teaches us in Psalms 119, in verse 9, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? doesn't say sin, because Jesus takes care of sin. But there is, some, there is a responsibility each of us have to make sure that our ways, or that we're in the right posture for, for our ways to be cleansed. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. So Jesus here, or the word of God is saying, how are you supposed to cleanse your way? How are you supposed to buy gold, which are the righteous works and the garments, which is the righteousness of God? How, how do you buy this? Well, you have to give your time to it. Amen? Jesus said where your heart is, there, were, there is your treasure. He's not just talking about money, but whatever you invest in, whatever you give your heart to, that is your treasure. So if your treasure is in social media, or if your treasure is in the things of this world, or if your treasure is in gossiping and hurting and slandering and breaking people down, that's your treasure. Amen? And then some people don't, because of the, the darkness in their heart with that, they don't even realize or can't, can't conceive why when they get into the presence of God, they can't feel the presence of God like everyone. It's because their ways, their heart is not committed unto God. And, and here's the next thing. So Jesus here was asked once in the gospel, what must I do to enter into life? And he gave a very interesting answer. When you consider the popular uh, talking points regarding salvation in today's uh, today's you know conversations within the church so in Matthew 19 and 16 he says behold uh, one one came and said unto him good master what good thing must I do that I may have eternal life and he said unto him why callest thou me good there is none good but one that is God but if you will enter into life keep the commandments and he said unto him which ones and Jesus said you shall not murder you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your mother and father, and thou shalt have, and thou shalt love your neighbor as thyself. And I want you to pay attention to that. All right? Notice Jesus didn't say covet. He didn't mention that. But the last thing he said, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Because Jesus was getting ready to deal with something that was in his heart. He didn't realize that he had. And then in verse 20 it says, And the young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Then Jesus said unto him, If you will be perfect. Doesn't the word of God say, Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. How can we be perfect? Because God gave everything in his son. So he's expecting that to be reciprocated back to him. But he's saying, what yet I lack? And Jesus said unto him, if thou will be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard this, and heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So Jesus was, first of all, Jesus knew this man. Obviously, he knew all men, the Bible says. But the man was boasting in the law. I have kept all of the law from my youth. He had an exterior appearance of keeping the law. Sure, he didn't commit adultery. He never stole from anyone. He never did any of these things. But God was still looking at his heart. No, you're holding on to this money. You're trusting in riches so much that you have not loved your neighbor as yourself. Because what was the challenge? He said, sell what you have and give it to the poor. So this young man must have walked around, saw the poor, saw the needed, needy, and still was willing to hold on to his riches because that was his identity. So God was dealing with the heart. God is like, no, you're not keeping the commandments. You're not keeping the commandments of God because you're breaking them from your heart because you're despising the poor. So Jesus even didn't even deny that the man kept the commandments outwardly. 
right? He didn't, he didn't deny that you needed to keep the commandments in order to enter life. But there's a problem. No one keeps the commandments from their heart. Let's go to Matthew 5 and 17. Matthew 5 and 17. Jesus says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth path, pass, excuse me, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them shall, ha shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And, and just so you know, when it says you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven, it doesn't mean like you'll have like a lower ranking in heaven or something like that. Or, you know, you'll be in heaven's ghetto or it doesn't mean that. It means you won't make it into the kingdom. You won't enter into the kingdom. You'll be least in the kingdom. But if you do these things, you'll be great, meaning you will enter into the kingdom. Verse 20, for I say unto you, accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the problem is not the commandment. It's not keeping the commandment. The problem is the commandment was never in the hearts of man. You cannot observe the law and the law enter into your heart if you don't have faith. Amen? Because what happened in the garden, God gave a command. He said, don't eat of the tree of good and evil. But the heart wasn't right because Eve desired to be wise. So there is something, even, even uh, before the fall, man's heart was still not right to where she was able to be deceived by the cunning craftiness of the serpent. Now, without the serpent, without temptation, she wouldn't have touched the, uh, the, the tree, but as soon as someone came twisting scripture, because if you listen to what the serpent taught, he said, you won't die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, that part is true, because even God said after they fell, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, but the lie was, you won't die. So that's what the enemy looks to do. That's what iniquity is. Is, is I'm going to have this outward appearance, but I'm not going to honor God from my heart. Because if there is truly honor in, in the heart of the woman or in the heart of man, they wouldn't have eaten from that tree. Because they would have honored the Lord from their heart. Now, this is the illustration I'm going to get, uh, get into here, okay? So what... Because even, even humans, even us, we don't even like when people don't mean things from their heart. Amen? If I was my wife's right here, if I looked at my wife and said, you know, you know I, I, would, I would cheat on you and commit adultery, but I don't want to go to hell, so I'm not, that's why I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it because I love you. I'm doing it because for me. Would that sound right? I'd be a waste... A waste man. Amen? You don't, husbands, you don't want to hear your wife say, I would leave you, but you know, the Bible says don't do it, so that's why I'm staying. I'm just here because I don't want to leave, I don't want that reproach. It's not because I love you. It's not because it's in my heart to stay. I, I just don't want to have a bad reputation. Would you like that? No, no one likes that. No one says, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be your friend because you have lots of money. You know, some people are friends with people just because they have lots of, but they're not crazy enough to say it, right? Because even we know that that's wrong, right? So God is now looking for us to have his heart so that when we do worship him and do things for him, it's because we love him, right? The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end. It's not the middle. It's the beginning. Yes, most of us got saved because we don't want to go to hell, right? But there should, be, there should come a point where I'm going to live right because I agree with God. It's past me going to hell and, and being rejected. No, I agree with God. 
His heart is in me. That's why I'm doing what is right because I'm a representation of him. I'm made in his image and in his likeness. So I'm going to assume that. And yes, amen. And I'm going to live right because I'm in fellowship with God. I agree with him. He's my friend. I'm his friend. The Bible says, see how sin knocks at your door, right? Well, the, the opposite of that is true. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice. And then the scripture says, if you hear his voice today, harden not your heart as your fathers did in the rebellion and tried me 40 years and, 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 and tested me. And they did not enter into the land because of unbelief. So the same way you could now yield to God when he knocks, or the same way you could yield to sin when it knocks at your door, like Cain, when it was trying to master him, now you could do the same thing with God. Every morning when you wake up, God says, get in the word, get into prayer, get into worship. Turn that off, turn that on, turn that off, reject that. Don't scroll there. Every day, God is giving us a chance to have his character put inside of us. So when you, when you now walk with God, you have to take that seriously. That's why the Bible says you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's how you start. But eventually now, the same way sin can become a stronghold in your life to where you can't help but sin. Amen? Some people are so bound to addictions, so bound to porn that they can't even control their thoughts. They can't even control the way they look at people. Well, if you respond to God in the same way you respond to sin, you won't be able to help but love somebody. You won't be able to help but pray for somebody. You won't be able to help but see what God sees. Amen? Because you have yielded your members. You have yielded your flesh. What was the requirement that God gave or Jesus gave to people that wanted to follow him? Any man who comes after me must first deny himself. You have to deny that flesh, that flesh that is calling you to be carnal. If you deny it, there's something that's going to happen. It's like a transference of, of energy or a transference of, of a desire. I've noticed that in my own life and I'm here to tell you it's true. If you reject sin for a period of time, something will happen where God will be the stronghold of your life. You won't be able to do, you won't be able to do anything but do things for God. It becomes easy to reject sin. Then you start seeing, not only are you no longer tempted by sin, but now you're repulsed by it. Like God is repulsed by it. But every day we have to respond to the yield, to, to the God's calling. We have to yield to him. If we don't yield, we won't receive the power. Amen? Psalms 37 and three, trust in the Lord and do good and you will dwell in the land and verily you will be fed. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way. See, notice the scripture again now is dealing with your heart and with your ways. Some people just focus on coming to an altar and say, God, forgive me. But their ways and their hearts are exactly the way they were when they made their way to the altar. And that's why people feel condemned. Because it's your heart. Your heart knows that you're holding on to sin. Your heart knows that you truly haven't let go of that thing. But when you let go of it, there's a peace that comes in. There is something, there's a presence that comes in and it makes everything right. But we, the Bible's saying here, we have to, A, trust the Lord. This means believing in him. Believing in him also in thought, but also in deed. Doing good. And then we will dwell in the land, and then we will be fed. We'll be fed by the Spirit. The Spirit of God will now begin to feed our spirit and build up our spirit so that we're mighty in the Lord. And then it says to delight, your, delight yourself in the Lord. You know how you do that? You have to get sin out of the way. You have to put the things aside that, that, that are just causing you to stumble. I'm sorry to say, like, you can't have both. I've tried. You can't. Amen? Whatever you allow you in your heart. You see, God is holy. 
So if you're allowing filth in your heart, he's not going to dwell in your heart. And that's why you're going to feel like God has abandoned you. It's not that he's abandoned you, but it's your sins that have separated you from God. Amen? That's why we have to meditate. Are you hearing me? Meditate. This is, this is when you give your time, when you turn everything off, and you allow the word of God to just sink into your soul. Sometimes you just got to read the word and then just think about it for 30 minutes. That's the way. Because Jesus said in Revelations, you have to buy. It's going to cost you something. In this sense, yes, sometimes it costs you things, but most of the time, it's going to cost you time. That's the only thing you have that you could offer God, that he wants, is your time. Because if, he, if you give him your time, now he's able to fill your heart. Because now your time is given to the things of God. When you give your time to the things of the flesh and the things of the world, now the world and the devil and flesh is filling your heart. So it, it's one or the other. When you wake up, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your time? Amen? And don't give God the, the, the bedtime prayers. I'm guilty. The little bedtime prayers where you don't even finish the prayer. You just fall asleep in the middle of prayer. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, you know my heart. <laughs> That's not going to get you anywhere. You can't give God. You got to give God the best hours of your day when you have all the energy. Amen? Because what does the scripture teach us? To love the Lord with all of our strength. Not the bedtime strength. Not the tossing and turning strength. You, when you're up, when you've had your breakfast and you're ready to go, you got to give God time. That's how, because now when you're, search, when you're seeking him with your time, when you're seeking him with all your strength, now your mind is more alert. Amen? You know how many times I try to read the Bible at night, like at midnight, and I'm just, my, like my face is in the Bible, like the Bible's, like I'm in it. That ain't because I look spiritual. That's because I shouldn't have been giving God my time during the day. Amen? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with praying yourself to sleep. I'm just saying don't let that be the only time when you pray. You, you done scroll through all of Instagram. You saw everyone's post in the world. You saw every hood fight video. You, you saw all of them. Everything. You saw everything going on in the, in, in the metaverse. And then you're like, okay, Jesus, it's 3 a.m. This is the witching hour, so I might as well pray before I get attacked in my sleep and wake up and can't move. Okay, God, uh, rebuke all the witches in Jesus' name. No, that ain't the time. The witches are probably still coming. Amen? Because you didn't give God all of your mind and all of your heart. Is this talking to somebody? Amen? Proverbs 1 in 20 and it says wisdom crieth without she uttereth her voice in the streets like the evangelist how many times have you gone out and said Jesus loves you and you get a middle finger like that to me just boggles my mind I, I, like I didn't even get to the controversial stuff like can you let me get there before you give me a middle finger like I'm just saying Jesus loves you and they're ready to fight amen she crieth in the cheese a chief place of concourse in the opening of the gates and in the city she uttered her words saying how long ye simple ones will you love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorner scorning and fools hate knowledge amen do you know that it is a sin to hate knowledge did you know that you know, and I found myself sometimes in that situation like, oh, I don't want to go into the Bible because it's probably going to not agree with what I want to do. That's, you're, you're just setting yourself up to be rejected. Verse 23, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. So we see here that there is a law that God is trying to write in our hearts. And, and here's the thing with, with Galatians 3. If you have time to read it and go study it, you know, Paul was not saying that the law was wrong. 
he, he was rebuking the church because they were trying to just keep the law externally and expect to receive the Holy Spirit. If you notice, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit never really indwelled within people. It came upon people to do something. Amen? Just like I believe the Spirit of the Lord came upon that woman yesterday to not run over my son. So sometimes the Holy Spirit could come upon anybody. Amen? But the Bible here is talking about when you, when, you, when you yield to wisdom and knowledge, she says, I will pour out my, my spirit upon you. Turn ye out my reproofs, it says at verse 23, and I will pour out my spirit upon you, and I will make known my words unto you. If you want to get deeper revelation and insight into the things of God, you have to turn at the reproofs. You, you, when, when the Holy Spirit prompts your heart not to say that, not to do that, you have to respond to it. Because the more you respond to it, the more knowledge you get from God. The more discerning you get from God. Verse 24. Sorry, no. Uh, uh, and I will make known my words unto you. Yes, verse 24. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded but ye have set at not all of my counsel. These are the people who say, oh, we don't got to follow any rules. We're just going to, just me and Jesus and, and, and my little personal, personal Jesus, which that is so unbiblical. There's no such thing as a personal Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church, the, the corporate body. So yes, we all have fellowship with him one-on-one, -on -one, but it's not your personal Jesus because that just opens the door for division. Because now, if leadership or elders are trying to rebuke you, you know, for, for doing certain things or doing certain things a certain way, now your rebuttal is going to be, well, Jesus didn't tell me that. You see, these little things that the enemy likes to creep in and with little, little one-liners and we just let it go, but we have to start challenging these things because they don't make sense. Amen. If God or Jesus is the head of the church, then that means we all have to follow his rule. We all have to follow his way. Verse 25. But ye have said at not all my counsel and with none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress, distress and anguish cometh upon you, then you will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So they didn't even follow the principle, the elementary, uh, elementary principles of God. They would not, they would, like, the, like it says in verse 30, they, it would none of my counsel. They wanted nothing to do with my instructions. They wanted nothing to do with the man of God that preached against what they were doing. They didn't want anything to do with it. Because you have to realize, and I'm closing with this, you know, because... Brother Luke put me on something, you know, because I grew up in a black church, so I thought it was normal to preach for three hours and four hours. <laughs> and he told me that's not how it is usually. You got to be short and concise. No, no. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, I, and he did say he loves it, but I was like, oh, wow, I thought we were just supposed to preach for eight hours. No, it's not the way it is. Then I started paying attention to other sermons. I'm like, yeah, they're not preaching that long. I don't know what's wrong with me. Anyways, um, but yes, I'm closing with this, okay? Because this is something God began to speak to me because it, it was segueing into something else that God was teaching me, you know, because hell, we have to start, you know, preaching and teaching on this stuff because a lot of people are going. And this is, and he spoke this to me. He's like, you need to check yourself, because there is coming something. You see, judgment has already begun. Judgment has already begun in the house of God. That's why you're seeing even some churches. Do you guys see that church in the States? It was like a gay church. And God struck it down with lightning. Like they didn't need to go look for nobody. Yeah, amen. Yeah, for real. Strike that down. Like shut that down. No, no, no. That thing was up in the Flames. Flames. Amen? Because God is not playing. He's not playing anymore. 
because there's so much at stake, there's so much on the line that he's not going to allow nonsense to, 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 to carry on for much longer. And so God is really challenging us to really get his laws in our heart. He's, he's, he's calling us, not even challenging. I believe he's calling, mandating that we give up our lives, truly give up our lives. And here's the thing. A lot of people have a fear that if they give up their lives, that life's going to be boring. It, you know, life won't have the same, you know, zeal and, and, and excitement. But that's a lie of the devil. The reason why you feel like that, because you have sin in your heart. But I'm telling you, if you give it up, the Bible says, if you delight yourselves in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. You'll begin to desire the things of God. See, the enemy likes to reinforce that lie that, man, if I give this up, if I give up the weed, if I give up the sex, if I give up the, the, the drunkenness, the stealing, the murder, all these things that give my flesh pleasure, that I won't have pleasure in life. But I'm here to tell you this is a lie. This is a lie. So I'm going to close here with Deuteronomy 27, and I'm going to make this altar call based on this. All right, Deuteronomy 27. And Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you this day, and it shall be on the day when ye shall pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord giveth thee, that thou shalt set thee up great stones and plaster them with plaster, and thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law. So Moses was instructing the Levites here, and the elders of Israel how to build an altar and the altar was comprised of stones we know that the commandments were given on tablets of stone amen and so they were to inscribe all of the commandments amen and I'm tying this in here to Matthew 5 and 21 and ye have heard that it has been said of them of old time thou shalt not kill and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that who, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if, thou, if you bring your gift to an altar and there remember that your brother has aught against thee, leave there thy gift and before the altar go thy way first be reconciled unto your brother and then come and offer thy gift verse 25 and I want you to hone in on this agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him lest at any time the adversary deliver thee up unto the judge and the judge deliver thee up unto the officer and thou be cast into prison verily I say unto you verily I say unto you you shall by no means Come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. So God, God spoke to me here and, you know, he showed me that the altar is supposed to be made according to the commandments. What am I, I'm not trying to teach something legalistic. I want you to think about this. The altar in Deuteronomy uh, 27, they were to inscribe the, the Ten Commandments on the altar. All the words of the law. Well, hatred and anger in your heart is the one thing you can't come to God with when you know that you've either offended somebody or that you are offended by someone. See, everything else, for the most part, you go to God to make right. But when you know that your brother or your sister has ought against you, the Bible says to leave your gift at the altar. Leave, leave what you're trying to get at the altar and go and make things right. Why? Because if you know seven things are an abomination unto God. He says six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. So when all seven of these things are activated, now it's an abomination. And the last thing it says, he that soweth discord among the brethren. Why? Because when hate and anger is in your heart, you can't come in unity with the brethren. Amen. When, when we're all trying to pray and seek God to get a breakthrough and you come in there with anger and hatred towards your own brother and sister, especially in the same church, 
there is no breakthrough because we're not coming in the spirit of unity so this is why God hates it this is why God wants us to have the law inscribed on our hearts because he really wants a breakthrough to happen in you but he's asking you he's commanding you make it right with your brother or your sister notice the Lord's prayer after he, he, he gave all of the template for the Lord's Prayer, he says the only thing he, he, he honed in on or harped on was, therefore, if you don't forgive your brother or your sister, their trespassers, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. That's the only thing besides blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing you cannot be forgiven. If it's unforgiveness. Because it's unbelief which is blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. But I'm not trying to equate the two. I'm saying if you don't forgive, then you truly don't believe what Jesus did on the cross. That's what it means. Because you're saying, well, Jesus died for my sins, but not his or hers. Because of look what they did. But Jesus died for all of our sins. Everybody. My sins, your sins, and the people out there, the people on the pride march, he died for all of our sins. So that's why we have to have unforgiveness out of our heart do you not know that unforgiveness is the one thing that's stopping most people from experiencing breakthrough you think it's a touch of God or you need a prophet to come and give you a word well the word has already been given you have to forgive because if you are living in unforgiveness you are blocking your blessing you are blocking your breakthrough you are blocking the anointing from really penetrating and changing your heart some of you can't be changed because you haven't forgiven your father you haven't forgiven your mother you haven't forgiven your brother or sister in church and some of you the altar call really yeah if you want to come to the altar and pray and get prayer and all that that's fine but some of you the altar call has to be I'm going to go and make it right with somebody I'm not saying you have to even you know what you have to do because here's the thing the Holy Spirit already showed you what you need to do I don't have to teach you anything the Bible says you have an anointing that no one needs to teach you anything. If, you're really, if you really have the Spirit of God, you know that what I'm saying is true. So with every head bowed and eye closed, and, and you know what? Even if you have to make it right with people in here, go and make it right with them. That's the altar call for some of you. I'm not saying you have to make a scene I'm not saying you have to go and come to the altar and make noise. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if you know you have something against somebody in the church, just go and make it right. And don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed that, man, what would they think that I've been holding a grudge secretly against them? It doesn't matter. Because if they're a mature believer, they'll be happy that you're getting that off your chest. They should be. But for some of you, it's a father-in-law. For some of you, it's a, it's a dad. For some of you, it's a brother. For some of you, it's an old friend. Maybe you've done something to someone and you know their life is a wreck because of what you did. And you never made it right with them. You never attempted to make it right with them. This is what this altar call is for. And I'm always going to open the altar for people that want to give their life to God. If, you, if you're in here and you don't know the Lord. If you're in here and you want to experience the power of forgiveness. The power of reconciliation. If you want God to reconcile something within your heart. And fix your heart. If you, if you want to just stop asking for forgiveness for sins and you want your heart now to be made right. I don't want to just get forgiveness for, for, for my mess ups. I want my spirit to be renewed. I want my mind transformed. I want God's desires to truly dwell within me. You could start making your way to this altar so that we can lay hands on you, so that we could pray so that you could be restored. Whatever that is, you could start making your way now. And don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Come to the altar. Let, let someone pray with you. 
Don't let pride. See, the devil loves to use pride because it's what got him kicked out of heaven. So he knows the power of pride. He's living through it right now. So you see, the enemy will try to make you feel prideful. Like, oh, I don't want to go to the altar. You know, I, I, I might even be on the, the leadership team or, you know, I might be looked at as someone who, no, that this, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's your soul. Fear the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. And then God will bring you from that fear to something greater to where you would agree with God. The altar's still open. I'm just going to give you guys a few more moments. But for the others, truly, and it might, it might mean you might need to make a phone call after service. It might need, mean, you, you, you know, you may have to really humble yourself and go to someone and say sorry. Or go to someone and say, I forgive you. And the thing is with forgiveness, the way you forgive somebody, it's, it's not what you think. It's not just saying, I forgive you. It's doing something nice for them. You see, as long as you are in a posture where you're doing something good, evil cannot rise up within you. If you spend enough time doing something good for somebody, you'll start to love them. You know, I had a neighbor, a next door neighbor, who would always call the bylaw officers on me for like the smallest things, the most, in my mind, ridiculous things. But instead of letting anger rise up in my heart, I began to say good morning to her. I began to show her kindness. Later, I found out that her daughter is actually a Christian. Her young daughter, 11-year-old, is a Christian. The mother's not, but she is. And my, my kids now are playing together. And I'm buying slushies for her and her, for my kids and her daughter. Do you know what that does to my heart? It makes me feel like, you know what? It's not even that deep. Okay, yeah, you called the cops on me. You lied. But I'm going to show the kindness. I'm going to show the love of God. And I don't hate that woman. I don't dislike her. She could call the cops again 20 million times. And it won't change how I feel about her because I'm too busy doing good to her. So if you want that kind of heart where... You're just going to be inclined to do good. Make your way to the altar. Father, we thank you for this message, God. Father, I pray, Father, that you would give, first of all, everybody that needs to go back and forgive somebody and make it right with somebody, God. Father, that you would give them the courage like you gave Joshua. The courage, oh God, to go into the promised land. Father, a lot of us are being stifled. A lot of us are at a standstill because of unforgiveness. But God, right now, I just pray for courage to approach people. I pray for humility, oh God, to approach people and either forgive them or ask for forgiveness. To humble ourselves that, God, we will no longer bring things to the altar with unconfessed for, uh, sin or unforgiveness in our heart. But God, right now, Make the change in my heart. Make the change in the hearts of the people here, oh God. For the people, God, who have been betrayed, oh God. Father, I pray that you will be close to their heart because even you were betrayed. You were betrayed by Peter. But yet you loved him. After you rose from the dead, you restored him. And so, Father, I just ask right now, at, the, at, at this altar, oh God, that you will restore the hearts of your people. God, Father, that you will, rest, you will turn our hearts of the sons and the daughters to their fathers, to their actual fathers. Father, I just pray um, against the curse of uh, divorce and abandonment, oh God, and, 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 and molestation. And all trauma, all childhood trauma, God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we bind that spirit. We bind that spirit, oh God. And Father, I just pray that your love 
Oh God, your love would enter into their hearts. Oh God, even now, by your spirit, that you will begin to write the law of God in their hearts. Right now, in the name of Jesus, each and every person here, God, that something would move right now in this altar, at this altar, oh God, and that you would have mercy on us, oh God. Loving kindness towards us, oh God, and that you will inscribe your, your law in our heart so that, God, we would delight in your ways. That we would delight in your ways. That we would delight in your ways, oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Father. Some of you need to open your mouth and just forgive them. Just say it. Just pray. Pray. Forgive them and then pray for them. The people that have hurt you. You need to start praying for them. You need to start praying for them at this altar. You need to start saying, Father, I don't care what they've done to me. Father, bless them. Father, speak to them. Reach them. Save them. Change them. Open your mouth. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And them, that lover, will eat the fruit of it. You need to declare something good over your enemies. You need to declare something because that is how your freedom and your breakthrough will start. When you start praying and doing good for your enemies. What you do at this altar is important, but what you do after is even more important. So pray for the courage as well, that the courage of God will really enter into your heart. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah, Father. Oh God, right now, let there be a move of the Spirit, oh God. Father, we, we, want, we want this church, oh God, to be Spirit-filled. Oh God, we don't want no root of bitterness, oh God. Right now, I pray that you will uproot the root of bitterness in our hearts, oh God. And that, Father, we would see clearly to do your will. To do what you have called us to do, God. That truly the law of the heart of God would be in our hearts, oh God. That we will have pleasure in your ways. In the name of Jesus. As the worship team comes to sing, we're going to pray that shackles are lifted off and that people will be able to, to make things right with God and, and with people and with others. Hallelujah.
Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine, and I surrender all. And I surrender all. all. Oh 
I just wanted to share something uh, with you guys. So that last part about making things right with people was not even in my notes. It was something just spontaneous. I really believe that's what, that's the message, the main message for our church, for this body. A lot of us, I want to reemphasize and stress, we need to go home and make things right with people. Okay? Because like the Bible says, if we don't, There'll be a root of bitterness, a root of offense. That's why people just get offended and just leave or get offended and don't deal with things because there's a root of bitterness. And sometimes it has nothing to do with people in the church. It's something that happened with someone else. You know, and if that person that hurt you is dead, just take it to the Lord. Get counseling for it. Amen. But I really, like I'm going to keep saying, I really believe there's a move of God that God wants to do. And he's already begin. He's already begun. All right. He's getting people ready to receive that. So I just want to re-emphasize: go and make it right with people. If it's in, if it's in private, that's fine. God will give you an opportunity. But let's all get our hearts right. Amen. Let's get our hearts right for the end times. Let's get our our hearts right for this last lap that we all have to go through. Amen. Because like, like someone was mentioning during the script, uh, scripture reading, you know, if you have sin in your heart, you won't be able to endure in the end. Because the number one thing that Jesus said about the end times is that the hearts of many will wax cold. The love of many will wax cold. You could only fake this thing for so long. If it's not sincere, eventually it will wax cold. Amen. And so even for me, the, I, there's someone I got to call. Okay, so I'm not putting myself above anybody. There's, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. It's cutting me while it's cutting you. So there's someone I got to call and to make things right with. I don't know if they'll be right with me, but I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to initiate that first contact. Amen. So Father, I just pray right now for all of us. Even if people didn't respond to the altar call because of pride or they, they didn't want to feel ashamed. Father, I just pray that in mercy and in loving kindness that you will go before us, oh God. Father, that you will give us courage. I'm just hearing that word in my spirit a lot, courage. Father, courage to approach people and make things right. And Father, I just pray for reconciliation, especially in the area of, of fathers and mothers and, 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 and family, oh God, where it's possible that we will be at peace with all men even if they don't agree with what we're believing in our doctrine but Father that there will be something on us that you will put the spirit of peace on us that in everything we do we would have peace in our heart Father I pray that there will be no racing thoughts uh, false prophecies and false ideas that well, what would happen if you reached out to said person father right now I pray that you will arrest every wicked thought from the enemy every fiery dart father to discourage your people father from doing what is right father I pray for courage to wax strong in your people and that father as we do this that when we come together truly that we will be in a spirit of unity spirit of unity oh God so that, God, you won't be displeased with our bickering and our fighting and our backbiting and our gossiping, oh God. But, God, that you will even change our hearts for brothers or sisters that have fallen, brothers or sisters who have strayed away, that our heart will be broken over them. 
and that we wouldn't just be happy that they're struggling or gone away. Father, that we would no longer have this heart. No longer have this heart, Father. That the spirit of disunity would be done away with once and for all. Father, that we would have all things common with one another. That we would have love for one another. True love for one another. In the name of Jesus. So, Father, I just pray as everyone goes, oh God, that the spirit of God would be upon them and in them. Oh God, that, that, that your, your encouragement, oh God, that the scriptures would, would come to mind and come to remembrance again. And Father, and that as they go, God, that you will prepare their way. Oh God, your word is a lamp unto our feet, oh God, and a light unto our path, oh God. So God, lead them in how they should go about it. Holy Spirit, speak to them. Give them dreams, visions on how they should go about it if need be. And Father, I just pray as we all fellowship, oh God, that we will stay in the spirit of love, that we will stay in the spirit of unity, oh God. Father, if there's anyone that we need to make it, back, uh, make it uh, good with, oh God, I pray that you'll prepare both of their hearts. The heart, the heart of the person that needs to confess and the heart of the person that needs to receive and that there will be love and reconciliation in this place, oh Father. In Jesus' name, Father, bless the food, bless the hands that have prepared it, bless the... The, the people that took time to bring it and even on a last uh, you know a short notice to, to, to prepare everything oh God because we couldn't do the barbecue God so Father bless them and bless the food oh God and bless our time of fellowship bless the evangelism oh God today and tomorrow Father I pray Father that you'll make a way for people that need to be there to be there that you'll give them the words to speak that they wouldn't premeditate what they're to say but God in that hour you'll give them a mouth of wisdom a mouth of wisdom, oh God, that the gainsayers would not be able to overcome, oh God. And I pray for some of the people in the trans uh, community or in the gay and lesbian community, oh Father. I pray that there will be a handful of people that will give their lives to the Lord, Father. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah, Father. Yes, God. I pray you will start to transform the gays and lesbians, oh God. And Father, there's a law that says that there's an anti-conversion law but father we don't care none of that father we don't care about it father because you are converting hearts oh god you are changing hearts oh god there is no law against the power of god there is no law that could stop the power of god so god i pray that a word will go out tomorrow and that father it would pierce the hearts and that you would take people out of that community that you would take them out of hell that you would take them away from the clutches of hell oh god and that you will prepare those moments, oh God. And Father, that, that the, those that are evangelizing, Father, that you'll give them a spirit of resilience, oh God. If water is thrown at them, if they're spat upon, Father, that they'll rejoice. Because God, you said that when we're persecuted, in that day to rejoice, for great is your reward in heaven. So Father, that we will look to get spat upon, that we will look uh, to, 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 to be assaulted if need be, oh God, because we know that there is a reward and that you will remove fear and, and anxiety, oh God, because we know it's a hostile territory. But Father, great greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So God, go before us. In that matter, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. And amen. Give the Lord some praise. Wave unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For all the great things he's going to do. Amen.